In the previous lecture, we talked about matrix transformations. In this lecture, we're going to generalize those ideas and talk about something called linear transformations. So first, let's remember that vocabulary that we established in that previous lecture. Any function from Rn to Rm is called a transformation. But given an m by n matrix A, the matrix transformation associated with A is the function that when we plug in the vector x, what we do is we multiply that vector by the matrix A. Now these matrix transformations have a couple of nice properties. So whenever we have our function t of x equals ax, one of the properties that we have is that t of u plus v equals t of u plus t of v. Why does that work? Well, remember the definition is that t of u plus v is the matrix A multiplied by the vector u plus v. Now note the notation here. This t of u plus v, that's a function notation. That's plugging u plus v into the function. This A with parentheses u plus v, that's matrix multiplied by a vector. So it looks the same. It looks like all I did is I changed the t to an A, but the parentheses mean something different the first time versus the second time. Anyway, one of the properties that we talked about when we multiply a matrix by a sum of two vectors is that we have distributivity, that that's a times u plus a times v. That's a nice property that matrix multiplication by vectors has. But a times u, that's t of u, and a times v, that's t of v, and that proves this property. Similarly, when I plug c times u into my transformation, that just means the matrix A multiplied by the vector Cu. And another one of the properties of matrix multiplied by a vector that we talked about is that the scalar multiple can be pulled out, so we just get C times Au, but that's C times T of U. And that proves this second property as well. So those are some nice properties that these matrix transformations have. And so our definition of linear transformation is any transformation that has these two properties is called a linear transformation. And so that means that every matrix transformation is a linear transformation. Linear transformations have some other nice properties as well. One is that when we plug in the zero vector, we get the zero vector. One way that we can prove that is by realizing that, well, when we plug the zero vector into our function, that's the same as zero times the zero vector. Multiplying the zero vector by zero, we still get the zero vector. But using our property of linearity, that scalar can be pulled out, and so we just get zero times t of the zero vector. And it doesn't matter what t of the zero vector is here. When we multiply it by the scalar zero, we're just going to get the zero vector. And so that checks out. Another property generalizes the two properties that we talked about. We talked about how we can pull out a scalar when we have t of a scalar times a vector, and we also talked about how t of a sum of two vectors is the sum of t of those vectors. And so this combines those two properties. So we have t of cu plus dv, and since that's t of a sum, one, our first linearity property says that that's t of the vectors individually. And then the second property of linearity, the second part of our definition, is that we can pull those scalars out. That's c times t of u plus d times t of v, and that proves our property. And in fact, that previous property generalizes. So if we have any number of vectors and corresponding scalars, then we say that t distributes or that t respects those operations, that t of the sum of scalars times vectors is the scalars times the sum of t of those vectors. So it's a generalized distributivity property, but what we say here is that t respects, that's the word here, the operations of vector addition and scalar multiplication. So now let's look at an example where a linear transformation like this might come up naturally. So we suppose that we have a company that produces two products, which we'll call B and C. And for each unit of each product produced, we have to spend money on materials, labor, and overhead. And for each unit, we're going to have a number that represents that individual cost. So here we have those numbers written in a table. 
So what we're reading here is that every unit of product B costs 45 cents of materials, every unit of product B costs 25 cents in labor, and every unit of product B costs 15 cents in overhead. Similarly, product C, every unit is 40 cents of materials, 35 cents of labor, and 15 cents of overhead. Now, it naturally makes sense to just take that grid of numbers and put them in a matrix, because really all the matrix is is just a way of organizing numbers in a rectangular shape. But given a production vector x, and what that means here is that x1 is how many units of product B we're producing, and x2 is how many units of product C that we're producing. Well then, then we would get the total cost of producing that many units of B and that many units of C simply by multiplying the matrix A by this vector x. So for example, if we knew that we were producing, let's say, 50 units of product B and 100 units of product C, our vector x would be the vector 50, 100. And so when we multiply this matrix by this vector, what we're getting is a linear combination of the columns of the matrix A. It's 50 times the first column, 0 0.45, 0 0.25, 0 0.15, plus 100 times the second column, 0 0.4, 0 0.35, 0 0.15. So multiplying that first vector by 50 is going to give us 22.5. Multiplying 0 0.25 by 50 is going to give us 12.5, and multiplying 50 by 0.15 is going to give us 7.5. Multiplying the second vector by 100 is going to give us 40, 35, 15, and then we add. So we get 62.5, 47.5, and 22.5. And remember the rows here were materials, labor, and overhead. And so that means that the total cost of materials for producing 50 units of B and 100 units of C is going to be $62.50. The total cost of labor to produce 50 units of B and 100 units of C is 47.5. And the total cost for overhead for producing these units will be $22.50. So it just gives us a natural way where this matrix multiplication might come up. And now let's think about what those linear transformation properties mean in this context. So when we say t of u plus v equals t of u plus t of v, what we're really saying is that if we combine two production vectors, so if this might be the production from yesterday and the production from today, or it might be the production from last year plus the production from this year, that if we combine those two production vectors together, the cost of that combined production is the sum of the costs of the individual production vectors. And t of cu equals c times t of u, that just means that if we were to, say, double our production, that would double the cost. If we triple the production, that would triple the cost. If we have our production, that would have the cost. In other words, scaling production scales the costs by the same factor. So those linearity properties really have real-world meaning that hopefully makes a lot of sense. And now this leaves us with a couple of questions. Are there linear transformations t that are not of the form t of x equals ax? So every matrix transformation is a linear transformation, but is every linear transformation a matrix transformation? And then the other question is, can we generalize this idea of linear transformations beyond functions just from Rn to Rm? Are there versions of this linearity idea that exists outside of the context of linear algebra? That second question isn't one we're going to talk about too much in this class, but we will allude to it in a couple different places.